I would be vain no matter what industry I was in. That's a terrible. No, you're probably right. <laughs> I would probably say that's true about you. <laughs> okay, let's let's not go down that road. That was horrible. <laughs> This guy says we're pivot. You understand just how we live it. This for me is like rap religion. Open on beat because we got this guy. When it comes to this, y'all, I can get it hype. When it comes to this, y'all, calm has risen. How you living, huh? Yo, how you living, pivot? I am technically a caveman, so even just putting these in my ear for some reason are a task. It's I'm the same way. Don't worry about it. That's why we get along so well. Yes, indeed. We do get along. And that can lead because me. Because I'm the same. I I feel like for two years we've been trying to figure this out. I mean, and I still haven't figured it out. Holy shit. I know, right? It's, <laughs> it's, like, it's not easier, by the way. Everybody's like, oh, you can, you know, tape yourself now in auditions. I'm like, it's the worst. Oh, uh, but you could do interviews. By the no, way, are, are, are you still auditioning? Always. always. Really? Not always. I, I will say I get offers. I mean, I do. But I do also still audition. Uh, if I feel that it is a part that, you know, they don't necessarily see me in, then I will fight for it for sure. Do you usually get self-empowered, fast-talking, bad bitch roles? And I say that with love. Please don't be offended. <laughs> <laughs> Do I usually? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. No, but I mean, that's because thanks to Entourage, you know. It's all Doug's fault. The great Doug Allen who wrote and created Entourage. And um, my, my face looks pretty terrible. Hold on. Um, you're... Yeah. Boy. Uh, I, I'm going to put these on to minimize the pain of the visual pain. You, here's what I'll be honest with you because I love you so much. I am playing a character that's younger than me. So I did something that most men don't do because I'm a little bitch. I had some sort of a face peel. And um, yeah, because I'm 200 years old and I'm playing a character that is 197 years old. So I'm trying, okay. to, I'm trying to bring it down a bit. <laughs> He's a Jewish tap dancer. I'm not making this up. Everything I'm saying is true. <laughs> is and, that the one in Slovakia? Correct. So I'm in, I'm in Slovakia and I'm playing a scene where I'm getting beaten up. And instead of letting my Turkish stuntman who looks better than me, is younger than me, stronger than me, better looking. And instead of letting him do my stunt, I throw myself into every one of the stunts, end up landing on my fist, onto my ribs, on the hardwood floor and broke eight ribs. That's what I did because I'm a genius. Oh my God, yeah. Jeremy! Only you. Yeah. Only you. Well, it th th being delusional has gotten me very far. <laughs> it right. has, but um, knowing one's limitations will set you free. And unfortunately, in this particular case, I didn't. And it was, it was, you know, lesson learned. You're never too old to learn learn that lesson. Listen, I think it's hard for us to even comprehend that we're getting older. I yeah. think that's the, you know, and in this business, we're not allowed to age uh, in general. So it's not all your fault. You should take some of that weight off of you and know that it's this industry's fault. <laughs> yeah, it's the industry's fault. But I, you know, and we don't have to talk about this too much, but I think obviously, you know, for whatever reason, men are allowed to look like shit and 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 but i th you know, that's a, that's a whole other conversation but i think to be totally honest with you i would be vain no matter what industry i was in that's a terrible no you're probably right <laughs> i would probably say that's true about you <laughs> okay let's let's not go down that road that was horrible am i still shining like a hebrew slave what's happening right now wait when did you get the peel <laughs> when did i get the peel i never thought yeah. i'd have this well, you, you, you're like a great therapist. Only you would bring out, I don't think I've told anyone. I've never really had one. And they, they were like, yeah, you look old. Um, and I have to, I have to, you know, play this younger character. So I did this thing that people do. And, um, I had it done a few days ago and, and it's all, it's, you know, it's the face is peeling off. Well, the only reason why I ask and I'm interested, I mean, besides all the obvious reasons I'm interested is because I was supposed to go do a appeal tomorrow. And now oh. I'm like, 
hmm, maybe I shouldn't because I have to work two days later. Ooh, we'll find out. They told me, I mean, look at my face. Uh, are we recording? Yes. We're recording. This is my, this is my life. <laughs> We're recording. Yeah, dummy, you, you, you've been live. I record while I sleep as well. It just never stops 24-7. Um, I was told this particular peel takes five days. This is a lot. This is the part where everyone starts turning off our podcast and does anything else. Celebrities, they're just like us. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I would say, I would say, look into that because you can't put makeup on for um, what I was told five days. But five days. But I got the old man peel. You, you got the, the young-ish, bad woman, what? amazing uh, peel. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I, I haven't done it yet so you know we'll see we'll see anyways so um anyways hi hello i like i like your your background there you got you got everyone there Ooh. yeah it's a little crazy it's a little crazy it's cool um this is our our entertainment room and it's the one place where i can get away from the dogs and the kid and the husband and all of that stuff but um well at least you have a dog and a kid and a husband what, what happened to your dog my dog bubba passed away and he he was oh. with he, yeah he was with me 24 7 and he was my little guy and he he, he went everywhere with me I, I took him on tour with me uh one time i was in san diego and he was backstage and he was in the green room watching me perform and then we went back to my hotel room and he was sitting on my feet and it was my first time taking him on the road with me. And um, he was on my feet and I'm just like, you, this is the cutest little thing in the world. You are so warm. And I looked down and he was peeing on me. Um, and it was really interesting because that's the, that's the way he treated me. He knew that I would do anything for him. And so he had me wrapped around his little finger and he passed away oh. and I, I miss him. Oh, I'm sorry. I know you loved Bubba. I love Bubba. And so I, I, I do need a wife and a dog. So, well, you know, you got to work at it. It's not easy. It's not something that just, you know, happens. Well, <laughs> that's a deep. You want to get into therapy? You want me to be your therapist today, Jeremy? I mean, haven't I always been that for you anyways? Well, you have to marry your soul before you marry your soulmate. That's very true. That's very true. Yeah. Um, if we were to head down this road, um, it, I would start crying like a grandmother and <laughs> you would not make all your other appointments. So we're going to have to veer back onto the little, uh, just, uh, just a little more. Does, does your career take, um, a, it looks like it took a turn after Entourage because I, I, I look at you, you started playing leads and you, and you were doing also house of cards and all these other things. Did, 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 how did things change? Because it felt like they did. Oh, you mean after Entourage yeah. specifically? Well, yeah. I I think, you know, Entourage was a very good launching pad for me in, in terms of playing the kind of strong, unfiltered, um, badass women. And yeah. I think because Dana was, you know, one of few strong women on that show in general. So I think that we stuck out even more so, right? And there were more strong women written in television shows. Not very many, but they started happening. And so because I was at the forefront of that, it kind of was a very easy transition to continue to play those roles. Um, and, you know, House of Cards, uh, you know, if you look at kind of all the House of Cards or Newsroom or Boston Legal, they all have a very similar through line, which is that woman that kind of doesn't take shit from anybody, yeah. uh, male or female. And um, so, yeah, I definitely, you know, I credit Doug for sure about, you know, making and developing Dana Gordon you know, with me over those years, you know, I mean, it's like, it's crazy to think that, you know, the show that I didn't want to do and my agents forced me to audition. I, I don't know if you know that story. about. I don't, I don't. 
But they, I didn't want to audition for the show because I saw the first season and I was like, all the girls are nude. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, Except, but not Perry, not not Mrs. Ari, not Perry Reeves. No, but Perry was still scantily clad uh, in clothing, even the first season, you know. But I mean, when you look like that, you know, Perry can. I mean, I I can't. I. I Anyways, that's a what whole are you nother. talking about? Dana and Ari ended up rekindling. Oh, I know, and that was uh, that was the most terrifying episode for me ever. Was going to that wardrobe fitting, and I was used to all my suits, and then they I saw that rack of all the lingerie, and I was like, oh, I feel sorry for that girl this season. And they said, oh no, no, those are that's for you. And I said, <laughs> oh no, 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 I didn't. That's not the part I signed up for. I didn't sign up for that part. Um, but anyway, but, you, but you did uh, it and you did it perfectly. And then I was like, where's my shirt? And they're like, no, fat, <laughs> fat boy, bar mitzvah boy, you're shirtless. And I was like, what's what's happening? I w let's go back to your audition. Oh, well, so I didn't want to audition. I I saw the first season and I was a, I wasn't a fan. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> um, and my agent said it's only three episodes um, it's, it, the show is going to be a cult hit. You have to audition for it. It just, it's only three episodes. Don't worry about it. And I was like, okay, fine. And, uh, I was in the waiting room. It was me and Connie Britton and Connie and I both were in the waiting room and she was like, what? I don't know that I want, I don't know that I want to be on the show. And I was like, oh, I don't want to be on this show. <laughs> no, this is not, Amazing. you know, and, and, um, <laughs> And so when I went in for the audition, you know, it was the room was really big. And all of the guys, it was like Doug and Rob. And uh, I mean, there was like five or six guys in the room and they were all way in the back. And the auditions were way at the opposite side of the room. And so I kind of, the first scene was like a scene with you and it was one line and it was on the phone yeah. and it was yelling at you. Yeah. And I said, you know, is this really necessary? It's one line. And they said, uh, yeah. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to put it on speakerphone because I'm not holding up a phone like a banana. Yeah. I, 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 you know, Doug has told me afterwards, he was like, oh, I already knew when you walked in. I was like, oh, that's Dana. Um, because I literally was kind of controlling the entire room. And uh, and then, you know, the rest is history. And then what? I was on the show for seven seasons. Don't go anywhere. How You Live in J-Pivot will be right back after we pay some bills. When you think of champagne, you automatically think of that classic tall flute to pour it in, right? But what you didn't know is the flute is not the best way to drink champagne. Now, most world-class sommeliers actually prefer the tulip glass. It's very close to the common white wine glass because it allows the bubbles to fully develop and release the aromas. It's mind-blowing, right? Well, I bet you never heard of Blida, which is basically an oversized shot glass used by the traditional winemakers of the Champagne region. Who knew? I didn't know. Well, just as you probably never considered a wine glass or Blida for Champagne, I bet you've also never heard of EPC Champagne. Now, EPC Champagne, this is the young French brand that is dusting off the aging image of Champagne and promoting ethics and sustainability over profits and quality over quantity. Finally, EPC is the fastest growing brand in Paris and is winning taste tests all over every competition across the globe. EPC not only offers innovative and contemporary drinking experience, it offers champagnes with complete transparency of production, something that is very rare with any champagne brand. EPC also understands the importance of health and responsible drinking, which is why all of their wines have low sugar content. It's lower than any of the other brands. And by the way, I just want to add that the lower the sugar, the lower the hangover. They're not claiming that, but I know that personally because I do a great deal of drinking. And I, anyway, I digress. They even have an award-winning sugar-free Blanc de Blanc. 
that's amazing. And don't miss out on their brand new rosé from Province. A rose bottle is absolutely beautiful and makes the perfect gift for any event. EPC will be available in the U.S. for the first time ever this year. But for the U.S. pre-launch, EPC offers to discover its wines before anyone else. Just follow EPC Champagne on Instagram and you could win their full range of champagnes and their brand new rosé. Just follow EPC Champagne and you could be the proud owner of these prestigious wines before anyone else. How cool is that? You can't lose. All you guys have to do, follow EPC Champagne on Instagram to enter. Let's get after it. One of the many things I noticed about you is, you know, you you alluded to the fact that it was a, it was a bit of a boys club, you know, and, yeah. and, but yet I would watch you and it was very interesting because you could navigate any one or any person or any situation and you were always just very comfortable in it um was that's the way it looked was that the case oh for sure i i was definitely never uncomfortable that's i mean i'm i've always been surrounded by men i mean i in <laughs> i don't mean that in a <laughs> <laughs> i don't mean it in any way that anyone is envisioning it i yeah. just mean it that like uh all of my friends in high school were mostly guys like i've always kind of felt that I was one of the boys one of I mean I don't know I just maybe that's me I've always been a tomboy I've always um you know women women are rough man they can be incredibly competitive and not nice and so I think that from an early age I gravitated towards where I felt I could just be who I was and um, and not feel like they were going to take me down or something like that. Um, but no, I, I mean, I, I have nothing but amazing memories of Entourage and you guys were always so wonderful to me. And, you know, some of my fondest memories are like being around the table with all of you and all of the guys just going, okay, Constance, let's talk about like, how do we, how do we find, how do we get good girlfriends? How do we find the women we're going to marry? How do we, where should we go to find, you know, uh, I don't want to say women like me, but like, where do, you know, that it was, it was just always felt like we were always doing this, right? It always felt like therapy sessions and like, oh, let's talk about this. And oh, what'd you guys do last night? And how'd you find that person? And you're not going to find someone, you know at a bar now, if it's people you, that I, yeah. I i probably should have had more conversations with you about that i think probably <laughs> probably like kevin Connolly was having those conversations with you and i should have been having those conversations and i thought you were going to say sitting around a table and doing a table read which for me was always very torturous because i'm a very slow starter and i like to kind of progress and ramp up until we are shooting and so I feel like if anyone heard the table read, they'd be like, who's playing Ari? Can, is that guy <laughs> filling in? Like, what's, what's happening right now? Because, they're, you know, and everyone's different. You know, as you know, there are some people that just right out of the gate, they're just, you know, right. Kev, Kevin Dillon would open his mouth and it was just hysterical. You know, yeah. anything in there for me, bro? And it was just <laughs> fucking, it's a wrap, you know? <laughs> I'm the same, though. Like, I can't even be fully immersed in the character until they say action. Yeah. I wonder what that is. Like, what is it? Are we afraid of, like, giving it away? Or, uh, you know, I always think my first reactions are my best reactions. And so I don't yeah. ever want to lose it. Or I don't know. It's interesting. I still struggle with that. I think it's that. I definitely think it's that because, you know, film is is one of these mediums. Obviously, when you're doing stage, you're rehearsing the hell out of it, and there are people in the back row that you have to reach. But with film, it's right there, and you you want to make it as truthful as possible. So yeah, we're we're figuring out how do we how do we peak at the right moment so that it's fresh for the first time and all that kind of stuff. And you're trying to trying to figure it out. And yeah, anyone watching us you know, out of the gate is, is not very impressed. So you have to put your ego aside and go, 
this is this is not going to be fun but it's but it's all part of it and every, everyone everyone has their own process and you have to respect their process like i would right. be i would be in the corner warming my voice up you know and making really weird sounds and stuff like that and and people would look at me like i was a lunatic and and i'm not doing it for no other reason than this is this is what i what i what i need to do and what we all need to do the only thing i don't want to do is is walk away from a scene and go, man, I wish I would have tried this. Why didn't I? I just want to figure, see if I can try everything that I can try. And sometimes I'm a pain in the ass because I want to do one more, you know. Um, right. And, you know, and one of the biggest things is to be okay making a fool of yourself, you know. And, and if if you're worried about how you look... It's funny. Someone someone came up to me. Some dude came up to me and goes, "Bro, I just have to tell you, you're very vain. But when you act, you're not vain." That's and, funny. And that's one of the biggest backhand compliments I've ever gotten. But I think that's right. that's the way you have to be. I'll never forget uh, another entourage story because I remember I was getting a pedicure, and I got a call from Gary. A.D. Gary yeah. on Entra. Yes. And Gary was like, hey, Constance, are you available to uh, get on the other phone call oh, of the shit. scene for Jeremy? And I said, uh, I mean, yeah, sure, of course. <laughs> right? And I'm in this tiny little, oh, um, you know, nail salon. Yeah. And I'm on the phone with you doing the other side of the phone call. And, you know, you're obviously yelling and screaming <laughs> at me and imagine I, that <laughs> yeah and it's so funny because the people around me must have thought like wow that woman is taking a lot of abuse and then i think it was one of the phone calls where i'm like you know fuck you ari or you know something yeah. and and then we hang up the call and it was so funny because you guys must have gotten it because then gary didn't call back so it was even funnier because then these women next to me were, they were like, Oh, good for you. Good for you. Way to tell. <laughs> <laughs> you stood up to him. That's right. I just remembered that as that was just a very funny thing. Like of all places. Well, first of all, thank you for doing that. You were always available to get on the other end of a call. And by the way, people don't realize that most actors, first of all, wouldn't do it. Um, and it's so valuable for the actor doing it because I'm actually playing off of you. And otherwise you, you've got anyone that can randomly, you know, fuck you, Ari. I told you I'm going to Cabo, right. Or whatever. Right. And you're trying. And, but for, for me, you know, you, you have to obviously do step up at no matter what the circumstances are, but I thank you for doing that because whenever they would ask me, I would do it as well. And I've been in some, imagine me, the things that I've said. And I remember being like the newsroom cafe and just like, you know, can you get on the other side for Rex? And I'm sure, and I'm just like, literally just like, you know, <laughs> if you can't get James Cameron on the blower, I'll choke you out with a fucking strap on, you know? And I was like, no, no, I, it's, you know, and people are like trying to eat their fucking ridiculous right. salad. And uh, I'm just screaming about strap ons and black dildos and it's just it's very awkward i mean look entourage was really good in that way right <laughs> yeah and and listen i'm sure you've had experiences where, with people where they see you and they think you're dana gordon because we've been in their living rooms yeah i mean and i always take it as the hugest compliment and it's always so funny how people are so embarrassed that they think that i'm dana and then they're like oh my god i'm so sorry and i'm like no, I actually take it as a huge compliment. It means that, like, you really thought I was an executive. I'll take it. I mean, you know, I've had people say, wait, don't you work on the Paramount lot? <laughs> That's... No, I, no, I don't work on the Paramount lot. Huh. Okay. Well, were you in this meeting for, <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, no. And then they come back, like, 30 minutes later. Oh, my God, I'm so sorry. You play an executive on television. I'm like. Yeah, that's okay. That's well, that, a very big compliment. Well, that's really cool that you hearing your perspective because, you know, you can imagine what I get 
and um yeah and, and guys are usually very disappointed to find out who i actually am you know what i mean and because you know I, I mean i've had men just say to me like you know just aren't you a little a, i just a little bit like am i just you know because they want they usually want to open with by telling me that they're the real ari which is adorable right. because yeah, of course they are you know and i'm not and you know, or, you know, just the other night I was at the improv and a guy said that he became an agent because of me. And oh. yeah, and I don't, I don't, you know, and, and the fact that I inspired anyone to do anything is, is kind of amazing. But I did have a guy at a party, you know, try to pitch me some of his clients. And I'm like, bro, I'm, what's going on here? You know, I'm not an agent. And it was, a, it was a very, it was a, it was a very awkward moment for him. But hearing your perspective is very, uh, it, it's really great for me to hear because I, I have to take it as nothing but a compliment, no matter how confusing it gets. Of course. I mean, the it's, yeah, I mean, I don't know how you take it as anything other because... Um, yes, we're in these people's living rooms and, you know, Entourage was seven seasons, right? Or was it eight? No, eight. it was seven, right? Eight. It was eight. 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 Sorry. Eight. I wasn't in, I wasn't in one, so I don't count it. There you go. Um, no. Very good. <laughs> no, but, um, you know, I think what's the part that's always weird to navigate is like the level of what Ari was and like, I have that uh, on Unreal with Quinn. Like, they're such intense, angry people that when when people come up to me and they're, like, afraid to talk to me because they think I'm going to yell at them, mm. that's when I'm a little, like, guys, it's a character. I'm actually, I'm actually not that mean at all. And... But it is still a compliment because it means that it was so believable, no matter how big it was, it's, I just, it makes me laugh. I'm just, I go, no, I'm, I'm not mean at all. And, you know, everybody always wants me to curse at them. And yeah. I'm like, I don't really, okay, but I don't really do that. But yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go anywhere. How You Live in J-Piv and we'll be right back after we pay some bills. So, you know, it's really interesting. Um, I, I smoke cigars all the time and, and everyone, if, if they're in a picture or whatever, someone says, hey, man, where'd you get those? And, uh, you know, I tell them and, you know, what my favorite cigars are. And then I just thought, you know what? I, because I'm very particular about my cigars. What is the best way to find a cigar that is really right for me that I love, that has everything that I want. I really, I, I want a, I want an easy draw. There's some cigars and I won't name any names, Cohiba, um, that are rolled. They're the best in the world, but they're rolled really tightly and it's, it's hard to pull off them. And so I want like a really easy draw. I want that rich layered flavor. Listen, I went to the, the good people at Illusione. Dion over there is the man. He's a master blender. And, um, he worked with me and he's patient and I'm a little bitch. I kept saying, listen, man, I want, you know what I mean? A little more of the coffee flavor. You know what I'm saying? Can we get some layers here and easier draw, whatever? And here we are, the J-Piv Robusto. I, I, I've, I never thought it would happen. I'm living the dream. Listen, LuxuryCigarClub.com is where you can order them. Uh, Illusioni makes them. They make them for me. It was a collaboration. I'm going to smoke one right now. If you guys send your review of the JPIV Robusto, I will send you a free stick and we shall raise one up together. I, I, it's the least I can do. You guys send me a review and let me know what you guys think. I really want to know. And the great thing about the internet is they're brutal. So I'm going to get it. You know, hey, be careful what you wish for. I look forward to it. I, I believe in these. J. Piver Busto. Thanks, you guys. Did you guys know that EPC Champagne is rated in the top 1% of wines in the world on Vivino, the Vivino app, okay? Comparatively, let me give you a little perspective. The rest of the French Champagnes with similar ratings are listed for hundreds of dollars compared to EPC, which costs merely a fraction of that amount. You can do the math on that. Great Champagne, 
for a fraction of the cost. Count me in. Here's something else I think is really cool. EPC offers customized bottle etchings so you can put on your own logo. I'm going to put a little JPIV on there or how you live in JPIV. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to start drinking. That's another problem that we don't have enough time for right now. Here's the deal. <laughs> Just imagine how cool you could feel popping your own personalized bottle this summer at the pool, your beach party with your friends, your birthday party, whatever. Giving that special little someone the perfect gift on the perfect day, just a little day drinking, I'll see you there. EPC will be available in the US for the first time ever, you guys. But the US pre-launch, EPC offers you to discover its wines before anyone else. Just follow EPC Champagne on Instagram and you could win their full range of champagnes and their brand new rosé. Just follow EPC Champagne and you could be the proud owner of these prestigious wines before anyone else. How cool is that? You can't lose. All you guys have to do, follow EPC Champagne on Instagram to enter. Let's get after it. You bet, you, you, you bet. If Dana Gordon was navigating today um, on television, could, could, what would that be like? What? You, what do you mean? Like on, you mean, what do you mean? Like I mean, within I, the show or as a, because, you know, there's obviously now since Entourage, like women are running studios and running um, networks and running, running a lot. So whereas when we were doing Entourage, it was such a novel idea. You know, Sherry Lansing was like the the one big, well, no, there was a few. There was actually a few at that time, um, but there weren't very many as there are today. So what do you mean by that question? Do you mean like no, within no, the show? No, you you just answered my question. That's exactly oh. what I meant by it. My, there you my, go. my My manager was on a call with CBS with, with everyone there and like most – almost every woman in a position of almost every person in a position of power was a woman and it's yeah. all because of Dana Gordon. Yeah, it's all because <laughs> of Dana Gordon. <laughs> no, I mean I think it's it's incredible though. That's what entertainment does, right? It it sometimes we can put characters in roles that that aren't as prevalent and can show what that can do and how that can change things. Um, that's what entertainment does, right? This is a tough one. And I know you, Constance, you may drop the gloves. Where do you think Ari would be um, dealing, navigating this time? Oh, oh navigating this time? Yeah. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Well, I feel like he would have, um, you know how when people are recovering alcoholics and they have a, um, is it a buddy? Like a, uh, um, sponsor. I feel like you, that Ari, I say you, that Ari, <laughs> yeah, this is where it gets weird, right? Yeah. Where you're like you, but not you, you know, the character <laughs> you played on television. <laughs> right. Right. Um, that I feel like you, you, you uh, that Ari would still be working in the way that he worked because he was good at his job, but he would kind of have to have this like cohort, like almost like a co host that would be like, uh, that was a little too much, or uh, be careful, right. or you know, because look, people don't change, and what people do is they have to adapt. And, you know, Ari Emanuel is still doing his job the way he's been doing his job. Um, he just probably can't get away with as much as he used to get away with, let's just say. Um, and it's having an awareness. But I do think that Ari had that, had the level of awareness. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, bringing it back to the storyline of, the, um, you going back to your wife, um, is, uh, there's a, there was that part of that soft soul of, of Ari that we all got to see and appreciate. So I just think that Ari would have leaned a little bit more into that and, you know, maybe have realized that he could still get as much done 
by maybe not yelling as much. Right. But, you know, I mean, I think it's why people loved Ari so much, too, is he was always saying the things that everybody wished they could say but didn't. And, um, yeah, so that's what's so interesting, by the way, that, I mean, think of some of the things that, that Ari said to Dana, you know, about Cabo and things that went down and oh, yeah. all, all this crazy stuff. So it wasn't just his, his, the tone of his voice, which he was yelling a lot. Um, it was what he was saying. And, you know, they obviously had this relationship and he loved Dana and loved his wife and loved Lloyd. And there was tough love everywhere. Um, and he had just a way of expressing himself that was authentic to him. And he was abrasive and funny and and all of these different things that today might be thoroughly misunderstood. Yes, for sure. And I think that we all have those people in our lives who might deal with situations that might not necessarily be appropriate, but you don't, you, you have discussions, you communicate, Mm -hmm. you, you know, you can't just write those people off. Um, Mm. You know, because I do think that you, when you, when you have people like that in your life, you are aware of that, right? And you either decide that I'm going to work with this person in this way and I'm going to help them or guide them to be better this way. Um, But to completely cut that person off, you're not going to help them, right? And those people can only be helped by the people around them who understand them and appreciate them for even the way that they might handle stuff. Um, uh, I don't well know if that said. makes sense. No, not only it makes more sense <laughs> than you may ever know because, because <laughs> that is the, the healthy and real and true and right way to proceed with that. And I think unfortunately um, for whatever the reasons we're living in times where people are, are writing people off and not willing to have these conversations with people and to figure out, you know, who, what they really mean, what is their intent, what's going on? Is there another way to say these things? Um, and so I I think it's fascinating and, and what you suggested about Ari, I think would be hysterical if we ever were to investigate these (laughs) characters again, which is that right hand man to help guide him socially. Um, and to navigate, you know, how many times he, correctly identified a pronoun how many times he uh mansplained aggressively right. you know what i mean right. and they could he could have a little card and he could tally it and they can have a, a huddle in a team meeting and i think ari would last about 11 seconds which would be hysterical or ari's entourage is all just people making sure he's pc so you have you have a woman you have uh, a bipoc person you have, uh, a, um, you know, somebody from the LGBTQ community, mm. you have another man and that becomes your entourage. So instead of your entourage being just all these like, you know, really cool guys and actors and this, it's like you actually have a team where it's like, is that right? Did I do that right? Okay, mm. I didn't. How can I do that both? Did I do that right? right. I mean, yeah, it's kind of a silly. It, no, it's just, it's just woke boot camp. He needs some yes. uh, a woke boot camp. And, right. and and by the way, count me in. <laughs> right. Count me in, man. I think yeah. that would be amazing. Yeah, or Ari has to be an assistant to a full all female staff. You know, that would also that would also bring Ari down to a level that uh, would be really interesting to watch. If all of if you had you know. You have a studio run by a woman. You have a network, and it's all women. And then Ari's in the middle, mm. and still doing his job, but now is in a surrounding where you know he's he just has to be very aware, yeah, a little bit more aware. Yeah, but I mean, I think 
that leads to uh, um, exciting and fun creative content. I mean, who no, would oh, who wouldn't want to see someone try to navigate that? That could that could be absolutely uh, fun beyond belief. Um, I remember, it's funny, I remember the New York Times coming to me and saying, do you want to talk about Constance? And I was like, oh my God, that would be, that's easy. <laughs> that's easy. And it was so easy to celebrate you. Um, and, and to be honest with you, you know, because, you know, um, for whatever reason, and, and before, you know, I remember winning the Fresh Face of the Year Award at 37, and I said, there's something fresh about my face. Thank you. Um, and and that never being the popular vote and always being... Uh, a journeyman actor, you know, to get attention for that was something I'd never experienced before. And it was such a pleasure to be able to celebrate you and talk about you and say like, you know, you were playing this character so fully and without any fear and navigating a bit of a boys club, but just being so, so strong uh, about it. Um, and then having the character evolve because you were that good and because we had this chemistry and you were amazing and then everything that happened to you since made sense in an arena that doesn't make a lot of sense. Thank you. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I mean, this, yeah. because we're always looking for logic and it does a lot of, a lot of things make sense. But I was like, yes, right. she's so good. And yes, she should be doing this. And I'm very happy for her. Well, that uh, you your interview was very sweet. It was very nice in the New York Times. It was that was for when I was doing Unreal, and yeah. you know I told you this last time we talked, and I was again surprised that I hadn't told you it before. But you know I modeled Quinn off of um, Ari and off of Anna Wintour. Oh my god. Uh, is kind of the how I created that character because even though my character is loosely based on a real person, I didn't want to know who that real person was. I didn't want to see her. I didn't want to know anything about her. I didn't want to know her name. I because I didn't want anything that I created um for that person to go, "Oh, well they got that because they followed me or they looked at interviews about me or whatever. I wanted her to be this just complete um, kind of creation of what was on the page mixed with the way that I kind of saw how insane she was. <laughs> so, I, I mean, that's a, that's a, those are two great inspirations because they're both very different, completely different. Yes. 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 But Anna Wintour has been known to yell, apparently. Okay, there you go. But she just seems very still. Um, you yeah. Know, and Ari's always in motion. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, it is fun because I, I will say, I mean, it was definitely the first time that I understood the joy that you must have had playing Ari all those years because as terrifying as it was for me the first season of unreal because i was like everyone's gonna hate her she's so mean she's a horrible person it's just like oh what she's doing to people is horrendous and but then it was so freeing mm. and the audience watching these characters it's very freeing for them because like what i was saying before is these become these characters that are saying everything that everybody wishes they could say or wishes they could yell at people. Um, and we're doing it kind of for them. And so there's a little bit of a, of a release and it, we don't have to be likable as you know, we just have to be relatable. That's all, you know, and, and making uh -huh. sure that once I didn't care, once I was like, Oh, I don't have to make her likable. Oh, well then, fuck it. I can do this. All right. Okay. I'll do that. And then, but I miss it. You know, I miss, I miss having that kind of character because those characters do not come around very often. No, no, they don't. Um, God, that was such a great quote. You don't have to be likable. You just have to be relatable. That's a great quote. Um, mm -hmm. and, and yes, as you know, it was very freeing. It was, you know, to be fully immersed in a character where you're just, 
Because what what's so fascinating is as human beings, you know, uh, I meditate all the time, and I, it's so stupid to talk about meditation, but you know, you're trying to. Oh, this is going to sound so insanely pretentious, <laughs> but you know, oh god, try try to to operate on your highest vibration. And the reality is that that Ari, even though he was a brilliant businessman and incredibly loyal and and monogamous to his wife, and that duality. I hung my hat on like make him look like a pig, but he's but he's but he's monogamous except for Dana, but that they weren't together. Um, right, they were on a break. <laughs> there you, you were go. on a break. <laughs> there you go. But so so Ari is incredibly reactive and will fly off the handle at, at any moment to ten at any at any moment, and we can't do that in our lives otherwise you know, it, your life will be tragic. And so, yeah, yeah I think, it, you know, and watching Quinn and and playing these characters is cathartic and really, really, it's just fun and freeing to go and lose your mind, break computers, fire people. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. I almost feel like they should, they should develop some sort of therapy for people where they can go to an office or a set or something and just role play and just go, bananas because i'm here to tell you it sure is fun yeah it definitely that that's that's true i mean i it's exhausting it's yeah, definitely exhausting. It, it is exhausting <laughs> you know what i'm glad you said that and i didn't it is exhausting um yeah. it is it i is. would i mean i would be so i'd be so fried and so drained and i felt like i was constantly walking around apologizing to people and like I'm so sorry. I'm not really this mean in real life. I said, eh, yeah. You know, it was just like, woo. But yeah, I, I do weirdly, weirdly miss it. It's a bizarre thing to miss, but I do miss it. Speaking of missing, yeah. it, missing it, would you ever do, a, uh, you know, everyone always asks me, when is, are you guys going to do a reboot of Entourage? And right. would you ever do that? I mean, I, it's interesting because I feel like specifically what Dana Gordon stood for, um, it would be very easy to reflect the changes in the business, yeah. which would be really nice for her to be at that uh, at that level that she fought so freaking hard for for so long. Um, and I, I definitely wouldn't, I, I don't know, I wouldn't say no. Because I owe a lot to Dana Gordon, and I, I do love that character as well. And I just think because the world has shifted um, in, in that direction, it would be interesting to see how that would change her. You know, um, mm. would she still be as angry as she was? Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, uh, yes, people don't change. But, um, yeah, I definitely wouldn't say no. It would just have to, you know, the, the difference about when people say a reboot of Entourage, like, it can't be a reboot. It kind of has to be a rebirth. There's a lot of things would have to be different and shift and change. Um, it doesn't mean that, the you know, and it'd be fun to see the characters shifted and changed uh, because of the times because people came to that show because they loved the characters, right? Mm, yeah. So if you take those characters and you put them in today's time, those characters are still, you're still going to love them and you're going to see them shifting and changing and evolving. And I, but they're still going to, you know, they're still going to do some of the shit that they did because that's why you love them. And, uh, but I do think it would be kind of interesting if you, if somebody, somebody, um, but <laughs> if, <laughs> because I mean, obviously that would have to be Doug, but yeah, you know, if it was done in a way where you could see those characters living in the world that we're living in today and how that changes them and affects them and uh, alters them. I, I mean, I definitely think Dana would be running the town. And it would be very funny because of the love that she and Ari had for each other. And it would be great to see a conversation where Dana had to like break it down to him, how he has to navigate. Right. Um, right. And, and the fact that she doesn't have the time to hold his hand, but, <laughs> but someone does. But, but 
would she anyways? Ooh. Mm-hmm. I know, because I think that I do believe that true love is true love. And there's a lot of people that you will hold their hand for as they walk through shit. Ooh. Uh, no matter what they've, wow. no matter what they've done to you. I just, I think that's true. I think that's honest. And, um, wow. you know, yeah, I, love I don't you. know. I love you, Constance. <laughs> My God, what just happened? <laughs> oh, I know. I just, I'm, it's, you know, it's, it's rough out there right now. And I yeah. think if, yeah. you know, if we all could just, show a little bit more love and care towards people that it might be easier to kind of try and get through some of this yeah stuff that's happening out there absolutely yes um we we need each other and um we have to have compassion for each other and we have to have tough conversations and as you alluded to earlier not just kind of write people off because we're all, you know, coming from places where we we have, you know, we've had pain, and we're navigating right. we're navigating the best that we can. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are some people that um, have shown uh, their colors, you know, for years, and and should have been, um, you know, have been treating people unfairly for a very long time yeah. and will never change. And so the, there's certain people that I do think um, it's like, bye, too, too little, too late. And you've already hurt a lot of people and somebody should have stopped you a long time ago. Um, but yes, I, I do think there is a part of the whole cancel culture that is, it's, it's, it gets a little frustrating at times because I do think some people who don't deserve it are getting um, thrown along, you know, thrown out with all the other garbage. Um, yeah. And, and like I said, every situation is different, right? So, but you shouldn't treat them all like they're the same. Well, I, I thank you for saying that because I believe that is the conversation people are having in private and not in public. So for you to say that I... I love that. And you're you're a real one. That's for sure. I know. Sometimes too real. Sometimes, you know. <laughs> you can never be. Maybe too, that. Yeah. <laughs> never. You, you can never be too real. Come on. What are you talking about? I don't know. It's just, you know, I'll probably get canceled. They'll be like, oh, really? You want to talk about cancel culture? Constance? Well, um, no, I just think, you know, we all have to be honest. If we could also, if we could just be honest, um, and stop lying and, uh, you know, just pretending that some of us are better than others when truthfully we're not, you know, we're, we're, we're all, we're all similar. We all are relatable and, um, Yeah. I just think it's a rough time and like to make it even rougher is not helping anybody. For, you, you know, from your mouth to God's ears, man. Um, yeah. I, I really appreciate that. And, um, um, how, how do we end this incredible conversation? I'm going to ask a very cheesy question. Um, <laughs> if, if we're, we're doing a, a new segment, there's like one thing in your life that you love. It could be anything. You know, uh, something mundane. I don't know. Right. I know. Well, I, I will say um, it just to keep it in the vein of entertainment mm. um, that I would say that, like, I really have found a new love in the business and in creating and actors and all of that stuff is because I've been directing and Ooh. That to me is like, okay, so this is going to be, this is going to be my, my other love. My, oh. yeah. I could, that's amazing. That's great. I can see you yeah. being a really good director. Um, I mean, I'm trying. It's, I do think actors make the best directors. Um, that might be biased, but I do think it's true because you and I have worked with a lot of directors and the ones who are actors or who have studied acting know that actors like to be talked to. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I can use a lot of my experience from working with all of these other directors and things that I know helps me as an actor that I can pass that on to help other actors. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I got a chance to work with the great Pete Berg, Peter Berg. And he's one of the, I think he's as, as prolific and celebrated as he is, I still think he's underrated. Um, and one of the things that he does is he creates an atmosphere for actors to feel comfortable and do their best work, which is totally underrated. You know, it's right. just like, cause we're about to make fools of ourselves. So, um, so please don't yell at me or, or, you know, just make, don't make it uncomfortable. Let me just you know, let us feel very comfortable and, and whatever that translates to. So, right. And I, I don't, I think even the most competent actors still like to be guided. Yes. You know, otherwise we're just, we're all over the place. And it's, it's nice to know when you can let loose and when you should hone in. And if you don't and you're not aware of the rest of the episode or the rest of the movie, that's the director that's there to say, hey, savor that bring it over here, you know, and yeah. Yeah. Don't show I that. Really t- mask that a little bit. That's going to come out later for the love of God. Let's, f- let's work and get that. But yeah, that's right. awesome. Yeah. Uh, I love that you're directing. That makes a lot of sense to me. Well, thanks. Yeah. It's yeah. been fun. You know, I, I mean, it's, it's hard of course, because I, I, I started directing on unreal and then wow. when Unreal was over, you know, I did the whole like meeting with all the executives and telling everybody I was serious about directing. And they're like, wait, but you're a working actor. How are you going to act and direct at the same time? And I said, well, how about you guys give me some directing jobs so I don't have to take all those acting jobs and then let's do this together, shall we? <laughs> but it's not, it's hard, man. It's it's definitely not easy. Luckily, they're there are more opportunities for women now uh, yeah. directing, but but there's it's it's still hard. It's still difficult. Well, uh, all I can say is I hope to uh, audition for you someday, and I, I hope that you. <laughs> yes, I will make you audition, Jeremy. I will make you audition. I will not offer it to you. <laughs> that would be that would be amazing. Listen, uh, I, I liked I liked what you did. But we're going a different way. Thank you, Jeremy. But I thought, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Uh the opportunity, Constance. Yeah, I'll be like, but wow, you look so young. Have you had a peel lately? I've been peeling. I'm peeling. I'm molting. I'm this is the first failed attempt at claymation. (laughs) (laughs) This has been amazing. I I thank you for your time. I know you're crazy busy and uh, I miss you. And I'll I know. I miss you too. I thanks for thanks for having me on. Namaste. Namaste. (laughs) I'll see you soon. (laughs) Okay, thanks. Bye, honey. That was great. How You Live in Jay Piven is a cast original podcast in association with Common Enemy. Producer is Kyle Tequila. Theme song by Common. To leave a message for Jeremy, go to speakpipe.com slash jpiven. Catch all new episodes of How You Live in Jay Piven every Wednesday on YouTube and everywhere you get your podcasts. 